On September the 7th, 2013, in Kazakhstan, President Xi Jinping made one of the most significant speeches in China's recent history. He announced the Built and Road Initiative, also known as the BRI, the largest infrastructure project since the Marshall Plan, aiming to modernize the ancient Silk Road, spring cities from the desert, forging new trade routes across continents and oceans, and launching whole countries into the global digital sphere. I'm Dr. Mei Shaw, an American-born Chinese raised in Taiwan and a professor of East Asian Studies in Contemporary China. I'll be exploring the revival of the ancient Silk Road, meeting businesses and entrepreneurs looking to benefit from the trillions of dollars of spending in this first phase of the Built and Road Initiative. This is a prime example of people who came in, started something, and suddenly people are gone. So the building is completely empty. I think he really means it. He's a visionary. Yeah. Sorry. <laughs> <laughs> Thank you. First stop, my home of the last four years. I'm at the beginning of my journey, and this is a perfect place to start. Deep inside the cargo port, I'm overwhelmed by the enormous structures, cranes, containers, and cargoes right behind me. This is where I get a real visual image of why Hong Kong has traditionally served as the gateway for China to reach the rest of the world. This is also where the maritime route of the Belt and Road Initiative begins. Since Hong Kong was handed to China from the British 20 years ago, it has operated within the One Country, Two Systems framework, allowing the city to do business with the rest of the world using its pre-handover laws and systems. Some would like Hong Kong to be the maritime powerhouse for the BRI, taking advantage of its international legal framework, savvy business skill sets, and sound financial structures. All this is happening at a time when Hong Kong sits at a crossroads, trying to find its place in the greater China narrative. So, does the BRI offer a unique opportunity for Hong Kong? I want to take this question to my students. Hi, class. Hello. Good afternoon. How are you guys doing today? Good? Yes? All right. So today is a little bit of an interesting discussion. Uh, we're going to talk about the Built Road Initiative. Um, I just want to quickly get an idea about how much you guys know about this topic. Filipinos have a deep respect for the Chinese in terms of business. So why won't we not join this big opportunity? Because it's basically like introducing Philippines to the world also. If we are talking about that kind of construction of infrastructure, we have to think about whether technology of the construction works or maybe the safety of the country. I feel that as a financial center, uh, Hong Kong didn't have a business sense, actually. We really can't influence uh, uh, this project, how it will go in any way. But what Hong Kong can do and has always done is that you try to find your, uh, your role in a, in a Chinese project and you try to find out how you can capture profits from this project. So at least for me, this is what I hope and think Hong Kong should do in this situation. Well, if I'm the business owner in other country like Indonesia or Thailand, I will think about there will lots of Chinese business owners come to my country and set up factories. They have technique, they have money. China has always had this strong sense of culture. Perhaps that is what Hong Kong can actually try to contribute to China. Hong Kong has been considered to be adaptable because they have been dealing with a lot of foreigners. Now that is something that Hong Kong can actually contribute to the success of BRI. Oh, China, this is what you have to do to deal with these people, etc., etc. That's a great, I think, perspective as an outsider looking in. 
The consensus of my students implies that there are great cultural and financial opportunities available to anyone willing to jump on board the BRI. After all, this is the world's largest infrastructure project since the Marshall Plan, and Hong Kong's international focus puts it in a great position to benefit. But I want to see how these issues matter outside the classroom. And as Hong Kong is expected to be the nexus of the maritime trade routes, where better to start than at one of the city's largest logistics companies? So I'm on my way to Care Logistics. I'm going to meet Mr. Eduardo Ernie, who is the executive director in North China. I'm pretty excited because Care Logistics is something that I think we live in Hong Kong, we see all the time. I always remember their orange and gray logo. It's very iconic. Also, when I was living in China, I see Carey Center, Carey Shopping Mall. Um, they run hotels, property management, and, and so on. So it's a huge, um, very visible conglomerate group. So I'm really excited about this. So how does the Build and Road Initiative actually benefit Care Logistics? The Belt and Road Initiative has opened up many new business opportunities. It has also become essential in our strategic framework for long-term development. With this new initiative, we now have a clear idea of where to expand. We are focusing on the economic corridors identified in the Belt and Road Initiative. What are some of the changes that you have seen at Care Logistics since the announcement of the initiative? One of the top agenda items is to push forward with the BRI, laying the groundwork of long-term expansion, especially across the six economic corridors, with two strategic acquisitions this year. One of those is a major logistic company in Central Asia. The other is a rail freight logistic company based in Lanzhou, China, with weekly scheduled block trains to Kazakhstan and Uzbekistan. We believe we are probably the only logistic company connecting East Asia to the entire CIS and the Caucasus. So when it comes to a business in North Asia, Southeast Asia, or now Central Asia, do you find it challenging with regards to some cultural or linguistics barriers or challenges? Very much. It's, uh, it's quite a, uh, one of the most challenging part, you know, uh, especially when you go into this uh, CIS country when they speak Russian languages. A lot of uh, overseas companies use Hong Kong as a, um, as a hub or as a entry point into Asia. In fact, One Belt, One Road is just a, a topic that I mean, make Hong Kong I mean, having more opportunities. Because logistics in Hong Kong is still growing. And uh, our company is also growing. Uh, growing in terms of bringing Hong Kong to connect with other parts of the world. Samuel, you're born and raised here. So I'm just curious, do you feel that the Build and Road Initiative the Hong Kong expertise can be transferred to many different cultures and cities and with different people? Certainly, yeah. Of course, Hong Kong people, particularly the young people, have to uh, pick up this opportunity, willing to travel, willing to work in other nearby countries, even go to the Central Asia. This is what I think um, the Hong Kong government and also Hong Kong business company let those young people to have this opportunity. How are the young people in Hong Kong today similar or different to your generation? First of all, they have much more opportunity than the time I grew up. And the uh, access of information, technology, they have uh, more uh, chances to understand things outside Hong Kong. Yeah. Does one build, one road make you more busy? Certainly. <laughs> <laughs> thank you very much thank for you, your time you. then, thank you. So here in Hong Kong, the BRI seems to be opening up exciting new possibilities and expanding horizons for both big business and the new generation of Hong Kong youth. And at this important moment in the city's long and fascinating history, Hong Kong and its people appear to be in a great position to benefit from the BRI, both strategically and financially. So somehow I'm getting a more hopeful picture at the whole initiative and Hong Kong's role here. Perhaps the industries are really welcoming the idea and embracing it. People can see that a lot of the groundworks have been laid and going along with what either the Beijing or the Hong Kong government is pushing forward to. So I can see a spirit of embrace and that's wonderful.
My second stop on the BRI maritime route is Malaysia. Due to its position along the Malacca Straits, it's always been a key country along the route. And recently, China pledged 34 billion US dollars into developing Malaysia's infrastructure. But the BRI isn't just about bricks and mortar. And here in Kuala Lumpur, a revolutionary digital project is underway. Southeast Asia is one of the fastest growing digital markets in the world. With a young tech-savvy population and a growing middle class, it's the new frontier for the next e-commerce boom. And in March 2017, Chinese tech billionaire Jack Ma and the Malaysian government announced a digital free trade zone, a plan to position themselves at the center of this tech explosion. The digital free trade zone liberalizes e-commerce across Southeast Asia. And having partnered with the Malaysian government, Ma's company Alibaba, often called the Amazon of China, went on to acquire 83% of Lazada, one of the region's biggest e-commerce platforms. Giving Malaysians easier access to Taobao, Alibaba's version of eBay that is hugely successful. The scale of Alibaba is staggering. Recently on China's equivalent Black Friday, it reported sales of $25.3 billion in just one day. A Chinese company that powerful often has to work closely with the Chinese government. So I want to find out, how does the Malaysian tech world feel about Jack Ma's helping hand? I'm meeting with Lazada Malaysia's CEO to understand how they'll benefit from riding the BRI's digital wave. First and foremost, I want to ask a really exciting thing, the collaboration between Alibaba and Lazada. In what ways do you think this is a win for Lazada as well as a win for Alibaba? I can't speak for Alibaba here, but I do think that it is part of their strategy to you know, open up to new markets. Mm -hmm. And I think they have decided uh, that Lazada is the company that knows the Southeast Asian market the best. The access we have to the talent and the knowledge and experience there is such a massive advantage for us. And it really allowed us to engage more with some of the brands that maybe were not willing to work with us before, but that gave them really the confidence that their partner in China, you know, is now maybe uh, also engaged here. So let's, let's engage more with Lazada. And it also gave the local SME bases in all the markets the confidence to say, okay, we know Alibaba, maybe if they come in, that e-commerce is really ready, let me adopt this too, let me bring my business online and let me try to expand my business um, through a digital solution and, and, and instead of building another store or building another warehouse. So Jack Ma mentioned that this is one of his ways to support the Built and Road initiative. I wonder if the people are aware of the collaboration between Lazada and, and Alibaba. What is your view on that? What we are really experiencing is a lot of excitement. Digital free trade zone. We have a batch of 1,500 tellers that we will enable to sell into the Chinese markets. We are working on a solution to you know, allow them to sell into other ASEAN markets. The DFTZ is an official BRI initiative aiming to turn Malaysia into Southeast Asia's e-fulfillment hub. The plan is to build cutting-edge, high-tech warehouses in Kuala Lumpur, making cross-region shipments more efficient and affordable. I'm on my way to meet Satish, who owns a company called Russell Taylors that imports and rebrands wholesale kitchen appliances from China. I wonder how he thinks the Lazada Alibaba partnership could benefit his business. Wow, so this is the warehouse. Do you take the whole space? Uh, no, we just rent a few racks in here based okay. on what our requirements are. So walk me through the process here. So these goods arrived from China in the container. And then where does it go next? So from here, we load it up into a truck and we ship it to Lazada's warehouse. So as and when there's an order by a customer, Lazada from their own warehouse will pick our item, wrap it up, and ship it to the customer. Um, it keeps my overheads lower, so I don't have to employ more manpower. And it's also more scalable, 
So if there's a surge in orders in, in Lazada, Lazada is the one who has to pick and pack the item, not me. Ah, so in a way you can focus on other things. That's right. I see, great, great. Do you have a market research team? No, I actually do everything myself. Even like designing the instruction manual, designing the packaging of the box. Do you sleep? <laughs> <laughs> let, let me show you a good. Okay, this great. Is the way. Where would you like to sell your things to? Uh, right now we only sell in Malaysia, but hopefully in the next two to three years we can expand regionally. Whoa. All right, there it is. Oh, wow. This is the Russell Taylor's AF14 air fryer. I love the packaging, actually. So, so here's a question. So you know that on Lazada now, because of the collaboration with Alibaba Group, they also opened up this Taobao collections. And I wonder um, if there is another merchant in China selling a similar product on Taobao at a slightly cheaper price, they might become your competitors. Are you worried about that? For my product category, I'm not too worried, but I know for other categories where the restri restrictions are not so strict, um, many of the merchants in Malaysia are not too happy about this Taobao collection. Oh, the merchants are not too happy. What about the consumers? Consumers are happy because they get it at a cheaper price. Ah. Uh, so that's another tricky part. I see. For Jack Ma and Alibaba, it's a win-win situation. Alibaba enters a new local market with a ready established firm and gets to leap on Amazon, positioning itself as the market leader in Southeast Asia. For the Malaysian consumer, it's great too, because all of a sudden they have access to more products from more outlets at digital speeds. But for Satish and his government, this e-commerce revolution presents both a great opportunity and a great dilemma. Because to expand and develop as quickly as possible, Malaysia and Malaysians need Alibaba's expertise, infrastructure, and capital. But at what cost? I'm here in Singapore, the third stop on the maritime route. Every time I come, I'm just impressed by how green and lush Singapore is, and I'm getting a glimpse of the future of garden cities. I'm curious to find out how Singapore might become the valuable partner to build and road initiative, helping the participating cities and countries to become more green, more sustainable. Jack Eun is an engineer turned entrepreneur who is hoping to radically change how we farm vegetables in rural areas and cities. His award-winning vertical farm technology has been in development for five years. And in 2016, his company Sky Grains secured a $20 million investment from a university in China. Hello, Jack. Nice to meet you. Hello. Thank you for having me here. Welcome to my farm. So this is your farm? Yes, yes, yes. I think this is my first time visiting a farm like this. So you have a big farm here. Um, how many kinds of vegetables are you growing? Um, we can grow more than 40 different types of vegetables with this model. Wow, that many. But we are concentrating particularly on seven types of vegetables. Well, seven. Mm. Such as cabbage, mm -hmm. nabai, Chinese cabbage, kale, mizona, mm -hmm. amaranth, oh. sometimes morning glory. Here we also grow lemongrass. Wow, I think this is my first time seeing the real lemongrass. Why do you need to grow lemongrass? Because it can prevent mosquitoes. This is a fish pond? Yes, uh, this is an aquaponic system. What is this? This is uh, tilapia. The tilapia fish can generate ammonium, a nitrogen fertilizer. 
so our plants can absorb it. At the same time, our plant waste can be used to feed the fish. This is our greenhouse, which has trees with vegetables in it. Oh, so the ones earlier were planted in small pots. Yes. The genius of Jack's system is its sustainability and efficiency. The vegetable plots are layered up to the roof, driven by a water wheel, using the same water to nourish the plants and the fish farm to fill the water with nutrients. It's an inspiring vision, and to date, Jack's technologies are being used in Singapore, China, Thailand, Malaysia, and Tahiti. Could you tell me how many floors there are here? Uh, 32 floors. Its rotation speed is one circle in 12 hours, every day from 7 a.m. in the morning to 7 p.m. in the evening. Can I try? Yes, yes. Can I? Yes. Mm, very fresh. Yeah, just harvested. Mm. After quitting his manufacturing business in 2009, Jack was given land from the Singaporean government to experiment with. From then on, there was no stopping him. Today, his company Sky Greens not only produces one ton of fresh supermarket vegetables every day, but also provides infrastructure and consultancy for any farmers or investors looking to use his high-yield, space-saving, eco-friendly model elsewhere. I want to take it home. I want to bring it home. <laughs> And this year, Jack's project in Hainan Island, China, yielded its first successful crop. I'm sure you have heard of the Build and Build Initiative. Does your business basically have any relationship to that? The BRI Initiative is of great importance to me because it passes through Cambodia and Laos. These countries are developing countries. With our system, you can make quadruple use of the land. Right. For example, you have this piece of land and you only need to plant on 10% of it. And then you can multiply. 10% of this land and you're free to develop the other 90%. Oh, I see, I see. So on this land they can do other things without influencing their farming productivity. So why don't we move the village farm into the city? So they can sell their produce in the middle of the city. So when you're meeting other business leaders or uh, professionals with expertise in Singapore, do you feel that they share the same vision or have they talked about it? If our generation doesn't care about the earth, it cannot grant survival of our next generation. I communicated with many experts not only from Singapore, but also from several other countries. And any and all contributions are not just made by one person, but all of us together, to bring benefits to the whole earth. So I'm not alone on this. Everyone is contributing. OK. Uh, <laughs> I think he really means it. He's He's a visionary, and, and this is really what you want to do, right, Jack? Yes. Um, but do you find that you're not alone on this journey, but I'm sure the people journeying along with you is not huge. But are you finding a few partners and friends? Yes. yes. Sorry. <laughs> <laughs> I'm sorry, I'm having a little, little bit of tears as well. I, I feel that Jack is moved to tears because he's really sharing with us the fundamental vision and and what is really motivating him and supporting him to do what he's doing. But the journey is, is a long and a tough one. It's tough. It's tough. Yes, it's tough. Initially, I thought the BRI would show me China exporting expertise across the 65 countries along the routes. But meeting Jack has turned that expectation on its head because he's exporting his knowledge back to China, helping them to overcome environmental issues caused by the rapid development and urbanization that the BRI will inevitably create. With the persistence of green entrepreneurs like Jack and China looking to take the lead in green technology, I'm hopeful that the BRI has the potential to help spread sustainable solutions throughout all the regions it touches, 
shaping a healthier future for our planet. In January 2017, China sent its first freight train all the way to London. Taking 18 days, half the time it would take to go by sea, it marked a major point in the development of the built route. The built route is not just the construction of one railway track, but the development of six economic corridors throughout Central Asia, the Middle East, and Europe bring together 65 countries through major infrastructure projects under the banner of the new Silk Road. A long way from the modern cities of Hong Kong, Kuala Lumpur, and Singapore, I've come to see where it all starts, deep in the isolated steppes of Kazakhstan, where one of the BRI's most ambitious and risky projects has begun. Kazakhstan is the largest landlocked country in the world, rich in natural energy resources, and historically considered the point where the East meets the West. I'm heading to a place called Horgos, on the Chinese-Kazakh border, most famous today as being that point on the map, farthest away from any ocean. Horgos was once better known as a key trading hub for Chinese and Central Asian merchants along the ancient Silk Road. But as the Silk Road withered, so Horgos died, and the buckle in the built route disappeared back into the desert. However, since the announcement of the BRI, new interest has come to this isolated region. And today, the Chinese and Kazakh governments are reviving the old Silk Road, switching camels for freight trains, hoping that a new Horgos will rise from the sands. The first step in the project was to create a Horgos Special Economic Zone. Since the 1990s, China has achieved great success in building special economic zones. One example was transforming Shenzhen from a small fishing town to a 10 million strong economic powerhouse. And here, the same trick is beginning to work. In just three years, the FEZ Horgos East Gate has sprouted from nothing, now housing the new Horgos Gateway, the largest dry port in the world. It's here that Chinese freight has been transferred across to smaller ex-Soviet tracks, continuing to Central Asia and Europe. For Chinese transit customers, this is a new route, only completed in 2015. So I want to see how phase one of the Horgos Regeneration Project is going. Previously, before the Special Economic Zone is built, what we're seeing is probably just like a desert land. Yeah, it was There's a desert. There's nothing, yeah, 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 right? Yeah, yeah. So this place really came out of nothing. Yeah, it came up from nothing. Um, but I'm curious then why Horgos, right? Why pick this particular location? Historically, Valley? it's 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 uh, gates of the Silk Road. Second, why Horgos? Because of uh, the local climate. Winter uh, is not snowy here, no wind, so it's dry. How has the Building Road Initiative helped you to maximize your commercial value and capacity? Focus from the uh, Chinese customers and fo also focus from all of the European customers has mm -hmm. grown. This program helps investors to invest here also. To pay attention. It to helps the logistic companies because they have good rates. At this point, are you running on your maximum capacity? Currently, we're working on 50 to 20 persons of our maximum capacity. So there is a huge room this, for it's a huge, growth. Huge, yeah, yeah. Uh, we are going to reach our capacity uh, by 2020. So we are two years from yeah. now. Yeah. That's pretty fast. That's pretty fast. Yeah. It seems that after only two years of business, the Horgos Gateway is thriving. But while building the gateway in this isolated area makes strategic sense, the second part of the investment is much more risky and far more symbolic. 
It's here, just 10 kilometers from the dry port, that the International Center for Cross-Border Cooperation, or the ICBC, is being built. The seed for the new city of Horgos. The ICBC is currently an area of 800 hectares split across the border, with separate Chinese and Kazakh sides, each country responsible for its own area. Taking advantage of its special economic privileges, it initially became a trading hub for small-scale merchants peddling goods across the border. But as the project matures, the investors hope that these conditions will lead to the explosion of a new megacity here in the desert. So I've come to meet the president of the Kazakh side to see how plans are progressing. Людей, которых мы хотим сюда привлечь, здесь три категории людей мы привлекаем. Это инвесторов, которые строят, людей, которые хотят заниматься здесь бизнесом, и туристов, которые хотят посетить МЦПС. Когда МЦПС только начинал работать, то первые туристы, заходившие из Казахстана, это были люди, покупавшие китайские товары с целью перепродажи. Но сейчас ситуация кардинальным образом стала меняться. А здесь и логистика. Здесь мы именно работаем на туристов и на бизнес-круги для встреч. Вот, цирк начинает в этом году, будет начать, начать строительство, и другие интересные туристические объекты. А, с делегацией из Таиланда, которая хочет строить тайский культурный центр, где будут тайский бокс, тайский массаж. Здесь только вот именно акцент а, туризм. А, но не только туризм с целью посетить или развлечься, но и медицинский туризм. Строится несколько медицинских центров, как для китайских туристов, это, допустим, центр пластической хирургии, так и для наших граждан, это центры китайской медицины. But to attract people to a city in the desert, is developing tourism and meeting places enough? В Китае 85% населения не имеет паспортов. У них очень сильно развит внутренний туризм. То есть это вот, вот этот регион Суар, Синьцзянь-Угурский автономный район, в год посещает 60 миллионов туристов из внутреннего Китая. Это потенциально наши клиенты. Some people say that this plus the Chinese side together, this will be the next Dubai. Здесь проект совсем другой. То есть здесь идет ежедневный культурный обмен между двумя не то что странами, между двумя разными цивилизациями. И он имеет гораздо больше будущего. Дубаи они развиваются уже просто становятся лучше, а мы развиваемся в совсем другом направлении, не только лучше, но и качество отношений между этими двумя странами совсем другое. There's a lot of impressive rhetoric around the ICBC, and it's backed up by the numbers. On the Chinese side alone, the new Horgos has already attracted 3.25 billion dollars of investment on a site projected to be the size of New York City. So is this the beginning of the future? The original Horgos grew naturally, the entrepreneurs of antiquity headed there as the Silk Road increased in traffic. In many ways, this is the modern take on the ancient practice of growing a city from a trading post. But the new Horgos is something different, a dual government-led initiative rather than an organic process. So traveling across this underdeveloped countryside begs the question, is it possible to manufacture a new city and a new economy in the middle of nowhere? Walking through the ICBC, the first thing you notice is that it's almost all one-way traffic. 
The Chinese tourists pose for pictures on the Chinese Kazakh border line, then cross over into the Kazakh side to buy fake goods imported from China in a half-completed shopping mall. Followed by more photos with a few local Kazakhs dressed in faux traditional clothing, or a tour of the area in a golf cart. With 93% of Chinese having no passports, creating a visa-free tourist destination seems like a smart plan. But the ICBC feels like an easy mixture of first-based tourism and low-level commerce, rather than the beginnings of the next Dubai. At the center of the ICBC is the border crossing. So as you can see on the ground, there are two lines. The blue line on this side represents Kazakhstan. The red line represents People's Republic of China. And you see a lot of Chinese tourists just standing here, taking pictures of people standing right between the two lines. It's quite the same. The idea is for the Kazakh side of the ICBC to be finished in 2018. But from what I can see, the target is unlikely to be met. Because outside the center of activity, the Kazakh side is one huge building site. The city of dreams is still being constructed, slowly, in the middle of a desert. I've come to meet two Kazakh businessmen who once lived in China. They're building a complex on the Kazakh side, and I would like to see how their investment in the new Horgos is developing. What is this place? Um, what is it trying to be in the end? Entertainment. Entertainment, leisure, shopping centers. So this area is our three-star hotel and commercial center project. The hotel has five floors and more than 180 rooms. The commercial center has three floors, including the basement. So when will you finish? In 2018. The end of 2018. Currently, every year, we have almost 5 million visitors from China. So, if that is the case, we will be able to build it all up really quickly. Did you have any worries or hesitations at first? Of course, we were worried when we decided to do it for the first time. Initially, with problems around the plans, and then later, the problems of constructing, fundraising, and selling. Those are all issues. Is this the first time that you invest in such a big project? And the first time to run it yourself? Yes, I think so. Of course, there are risks. Maybe you have to be a pioneer. Anything is possible. So there are risks and opportunities at the same time. Hence, you just asked whether we did a serious evaluation. We didn't do a lot of research. It could be related to our personality. We like adventure. But of course, we worry as well. The developers took me on a journey of the Kazakh side, away from their own site, to show me how other projects were progressing. Currently, these pieces of land are still empty. Perhaps they started to work on something and it wasn't approved, and the plans dissolved. Yeah, this company also disappeared. Disappeared after how long the construction has started? Since about last year. Maybe two years. It's been left here for two years? Yeah, that's right. So this place is a prime example of people who came in, started something, but there's construction and suddenly people are gone. So the building is completely empty. The site is just left alone, like this. So when you first came here, didn't you see this phenomenon happening? Yeah, we saw it. But you still wanted to come in? No, it's their problem. Their plot is too big. So now, there aren't any investors. So here, it's very interesting. So this is another complex. I believe they're probably going to make it some kind of Dutch-flavored hotel and shopping mall because uh, the name of the project is called Tulip. And interestingly, the way they do the poster here, they specifically point out Built and Road Initiative. So basically to say that this is coming out of the initiative and there comes this business opportunity. We stopped the car overlooking the Chinese side to see the contrast between the two sides of the zone. 
So if you're standing here, you can actually see this sharp contrast between the Chinese side and the Kazakhstani side. On this side, most of these buildings and the constructions are done by the government. Whereas if you walk back to the Kazakhstani side, um, you see sporadic constructions. There is much less governmental-led initiatives over here. But I was told that these two buildings actually belong to one development, which actually has been put on hold. So the Suxing Center, is it an office building? Yeah, office buildings. And how many companies are in there now? They are empty. How long have they been completed? It was done before I got here, a few years ago. Everything built, but they aren't able to get the people in. Is it possible for this place to become Central Asia's Las Vegas? Everyone is talking about the gambling industry. It's a very interesting business. Everyone wants it to happen. So businessmen that are interested in this area are keeping it in the backs of their minds, especially China. Well, I wish you all the best over here. You really have a lot of courage for coming in and investing. Thank you. Really, it's a lot of courage. And if it's a success, I'm sure we'll see each other again. We'll come and pay you a visit again. Okay, thank you. Thank you. Thank you so thank much. Thank you. Thank you. How the new Horgles will eventually look is still open to speculation. The 2018 launch date does seem like a pipe dream. I'm curious to see what this place will look like in 10 years. Will it be a thriving metropolis? Or will the new Horgos slowly return to the dust? fundamental thing that will help Kyrgyz Republic uh, leapfrog into a you know, better country with better economy is technology and like technological innovation. For the last leg of my journey, I'm heading to Kyrgyzstan, one of the poorest republics in the former Soviet Union. Traversing across the spectacular but barren steps, I wonder how will the BRI invest successfully in places as isolated and underdeveloped as this? As I pass into Kyrgyzstan, the landscape suddenly blossoms. But despite the beauty, I've arrived in a country that, unlike Kazakhstan, is resource poor with little gas or oil. After the announcement of the BRI, former President Atambayev moved swiftly to propose various infrastructure projects with China, building roads and railway lines. But has Kyrgyzstan got more to gain than simply an enhanced transport system? Is there another sector through which the BRI can help grow the national economy? I'm here to meet a young group of Kyrgyz entrepreneurs who may hold the key to their country's future. At the university, we had this kind of uh, motto, if not us, then who, if not now, then when. I think that I'm one of those people who can uh, change the uh, country for better. Aziz Sotobayev is a man on a mission. He set up his company, KG Labs, to boost tech entrepreneurship in Kyrgyzstan and hopes to help turn his country into Central Asia's tech hub. Keen to show me the rise of Bishkek, Aziz took me on a tour of the city's tech hotspots. So this is Alalo House? Yeah, welcome to Alalo. <laughs> um, this is the uh, main co-working space in Bishkek City. That's a part of the uh, landscape. Incubation hubs like this are the backbone of startup culture in the West. And here in Bishkek, there are a number of hubs that help cultivate ideas and relationships. Aziz wanted to introduce me to two extraordinary local entrepreneurs who are having global success. Yeah. Hi. Yeah. I'm Hello. May. She is CEO of Matt Devs. Oh, I and think I met uh, the right person. Matt Devs is a developer outsourced company that has clients all over the world, from Singapore to Silicon Valley. Close to home, it has developed the systems for Namba Taxis and Namba Food, Kyrgyzstan's answer to Uber and Deliveroo. 
he has some best developers in the U.S. Silicon Valley. Yeah. How do you compete? We are much cheaper. Aha! <laughs> uh -huh. Yeah. You're much Our cheaper. Cost advantage. By how much? Maybe three or four times. But then yeah. you can provide almost the same quality of work and service. In most cases, even better. Even better? Absolutely. How do you get people to be so good? Uh, we have a very rough program. We call it Hunger Games. Yeah. <laughs> we collect people, those who want to become a good developer. Uh, we prepare for them a very hard program. In most cases, impossible, actually, you know? <laughs> and the strongest ones, they become actually the ones that we finally start to call people. Do you think that this could potentially be the pillar economy for your country? What makes our communities different is that it's growing organically and the initiatives come from community, not the government, not educational institutions. We don't have oil. <laughs> That's our competitive advantage. We just have to use what we have. Our brains. Our brains, yes. Across the hall is another impressive Bishkek startup created by Ibek Esengulov. Make use of .com rapidly grew to become one of the most successful tech sites in the world, averaging 45 million hits per month. This is a global operation, basically, yeah. but the idea started here in Bishkek. Uh, yeah, yeah. Now that is just mind blowing. I guess a lot of your users don't even expect that. This they, is from Bishkek. Yeah, it's a nature of our country. Most of us are entrepreneurs. There are not many people working in government jobs, but a lot of people are running some kind of small business. Right. So among the young generation, they are now considering to start that small business in the area of IT. So I don't know how familiar you are with China's One Belt, One Road project. Do you think that could potentially bring any change of landscape in your industry? Generally speaking about China, we, we don't know much about that ecosystem because it's closed. Yeah. Uh, uh, but uh, they have some of the most uh, successful business models uh, mm -hmm. for the IT startups ever made. Like uh, they have WeChat right now. Even here in Bishkek right now, there are startups that are trying to replicate the WeChat. Well, this it can also bring competitors, right? For example, what if WeChat decides to come in and take over the market? I mean, could that happen? Yeah, I think, uh, in my opinion, competition is good in IT because uh, when you're competing in IT, you, everyone is more or less on the same level. In IT, in particular, it's, it's about... Uh, Who has the best idea? Yeah, right? best idea and implementation. Yeah. Thank you. Without Build and Road initiative, would it change anything? Hmm. Would it change what, you, what you're doing? The accomplishment of this project would positively impact into how plans just like you know in uh, surfing you, you would just like find the right way for, for you and like from China would come like a big wave that would uh, have a positive impact but you know we will still be doing uh, good without even those initiatives because you love surfing anyway yeah. right it just <laughs> happens that there's a big wave yeah. coming yeah. but even with the smaller waves you'll still surf yeah why not <laughs> we will create those waves ourselves <laughs> So the tech industry in Kyrgyzstan looks vibrant and healthy, and along with the BRI, its digital future should only grow. But now, as I'm at the end of my exploration into the first phase of the Build and Road initiative, I wonder what will the future hold? The BRI plows on, forging new relationships, striking new deals, and integrating new economic policies. Its skill, scope, and ambition grows with each passing year, now encompassing game-changing digital innovation in tandem with astonishing world-class infrastructure. As I've traveled through the megacities of Southeast Asia, all the way to the mountains and deserts of Central Asia, I can't help but feel that I'm always connecting with something or someone that has been touched by the massive ambition of the Build and Road Initiative. But as I've seen, with great ambition comes great risk, both financial, political, and cultural. So only time will tell if China's long-term vision will pay off for the people I've met along my journey. To me, they are the real game changers. They are the true pioneers. 
of this new Silk Road. 